Good day, Sunshines. Welcome back to the Nikki Sun Show. I'm your host, Nikki Sun, and we are so privileged to be in conversation with co writer and lead actress of the first Amazon original to come out from Australia. She is a content creator, a filmmaker, and an actress. Please welcome to the stage, Shuang Hu, aka Shu. How are you? Oh, good. How are you? <laughs> Wonderful. I mean, you're getting ready for a pretty big day today, and I'm so excited to deep dive into all of that. But how are you mm -hmm. feeling? You're premiere for Five Blind Dates is coming out tonight. I know. Uh, I'm nervous, uh, I, th I think. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how I feel about it. I think the lead up to it has been so long that I'm almost just like, okay, can it just be here already? I'm, yeah, I'm just ready for it to be here. All right. Well, to calm the nerves, I do know mm -hmm. that in your film, you are the owner of a very cool tea shop mm -hmm. and you love artisanal teas as yeah. much as I do as well. So I brought along my tea set and I thought we could pour uh, some tea to get this conversation started but we did pick which one did you like uh we picked the yamacha I think. and the hojicha Yama? yeah hojicha? Oh. but yes. it's hojicha so is that yes. one of your Japanese. favorite teas um I would say it's one of my favorite Japanese teas my overall favorite tea is a green tea can't mm. go wrong with a nice green tea do you have a specific brand that you want to plug no no one's, <laughs> no one's paying me enough to plug them <laughs> I love that. And that's the thing. I love this because in our interviews, I talk to a lot of content creators. We break down the process. We are transparent as much as you'd like to be. So no pressure. You have amassed 11 million plus followers across all your social media. I've been stalking you. YouTube, TikTok, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, Instagram. And I just kind of want to talk about your journey going in from short form to co-writing a film that Amazon decided to pick up and decided to make it the first original film from Australia. That's huge. It's wild. So yeah. take us through that journey. Like, how did it start? And first of all, cheers. Oh, cheers. <laughs> cheers to us. It's actually cheers really good. Trust okay. Marty. Sorry. Cool. Yum. That's the perfect temperature. I let yeah. it steep for at least four minutes. Before. Yeah, great. Yeah. Smart. Get the flavor out. Yeah. Love it's it. like, what are you tasting? What are the notes first? Mm. It's um cooked, cooked. You know, like baked tea. Yeah. Kind of tastes like like rice. Yeah, <laughs> like roast. It's roasted. roasted. Yeah, roasted that that is a hoji cha tea. Yeah. So, girl, spill the tea. Oh, guy, guy. Okay, she wants me to spill the tea while I drink the tea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh gosh, where to start? It's been so long because now that I think about it, we started this in 2020. That's when I pitched the movie to Amazon. That's also when. I started to find some ground on social media. And so it all happened all at once in 2020. And now we're in 2024 already. Well, 2020 pre or post COVID or during COVID? During. Wow. It was my, okay, so my social media, I started that just before COVID. It was yes. like February. I remember making my first video in February. It didn't do that well. It, you know, it, just, it, was, it was nothing. And, but it was the the actual pandemic that forced me to create content because I had nothing else to do. You know, our whole industry shut down. So I had two friends that also were making content at the same time. And we all kind of just started making content together because we quarantined together. And so for the next six months, we were just making content three times a week. I was editing every day a, a video and just like posting it every day on time. Um, for, I like how you, you said know, on time. Yeah. So you had a content creator schedule. Yeah, I did. <laughs> was it Tuesdays, Thursdays? It was like... When at 9, 12 and 5? <laughs> yeah. Fridays at 1 p.m. <laughs> no traction. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was like that. Okay. Yeah, it was solid, like really like a few thousand views for okay. the first few months. And then all of a sudden one of my videos popped off and then they- Which one was all, it? It was uh, titled When Your Crush Is A Tease. When Your Crush Is A Tease. Yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> I feel like we should reenact this. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> Stop. Oh my god. It's, oh, do you want the tea? Because this is a day. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> when your crush is a tease. And yeah. that blew up. And this was yeah. TikTok or? This was on TikTok. TikTok, okay. Yeah. And then um, every video 
after that pretty much was a hit because I just made the same kind of content. Okay. Because once one goes off, you you figure out that that's what your niche is and that's what your fans want of you. And mm. so you just keep doing the same thing. And the yeah, and then you when you pivot, that's usually when you see like a decline. It's yeah. because you change and when you want to do something different. Okay, so just to put everything in perspective, how many videos of different niches or genres did you do before one of them actually did hit? Because I feel like a lot of content creators mm. feel like, I found it in a day. And I'm like, that is not realistic. Yeah, yeah. So like how many buckets or genres did you do before you found the one that hit? Um, I would say maybe five or six. Okay. It was all very similar style. Also, all based around romance, a boyfriend girlfriend situation. Okay, but it was made differently. It was a different style of content. Like mm -hmm. a, it was, I think, still mostly skits. But I, I tried the whole like two person interaction. I tried like the back and forth skit style, and then I think it was a style of content. Okay, that hit it off. Can we talk about the style? Because I feel like your content hits a very specific demographic and audience that really just eats it all up on TikTok. How do you describe your style of content? I just say comedy skits. Okay. Uh, it's a comedy skit, but I say that leans towards romance and relatable content. Okay. Yeah, I think I would try to make relatable content okay. that the mass audience will be able to, uh, I guess, like laugh with. Because the whole point of relatability is laughability, mm -hmm. being able to, for people to say, oh, I get it. Yeah. So in order for most people to get it, you got to make something relatable that most people understand. You can't do too niche. Otherwise you do go into like this niche category or like a niche lane, okay. which, um, you know, some people do. I just don't think I'm good at that. Cause I don't think I'm like a niche creator. I think I'm just mostly bored humor. So uh, you <laughs> pandemic did, couple of contents and figured out your niche yeah things popped off and then you worked with uh, Amazon on this film or how did it happen so I think it was luck you know they say luck is opportunity meets timing or like opportunity meets preparation okay. that's exactly what it was so my writing partner Nathan Ramos Park and I we were shout all, out to Nathan they shout together. out to Nathan we love Nathan <laughs> <laughs> we were wanting to write a rom-com together we had already been talking about it and this was late 2021 okay. we had penned this idea and we were going to do an outline and everything and then the pandemic hit, so we couldn't do anything. But then his friend from Amazon, so he knew someone at Amazon okay. who was heading the Australian arm of Amazon Studios. Ah. And, they, and they were like, oh, we're looking for diverse Australian stories. And we just happened to have the story and Nathan soft pitched it to them. And they liked it. They said, why don't you give us a formal pitch in a few weeks? So me and Nathan just like quickly started working on an outline and then uh, we pitched it to them. And the, this pitch meeting was on Zoom, my first ever pitch to a studio. And there was like seven people on the call, quite high up executives. And um, we did the spiel with just a copy of the character sheet. And we did the spiel just verbally, nothing written. And they just, they loved it. They fell in love with the story and they were like, great, we want to make this. So within a couple of weeks, we were doing a deal with them. Oh my and gosh. Yeah. Well, what was your soft pitch? I mean, <laughs> can I hear a little bit about kind of what Five Blind Dates is about? And was that the original title in the beginning? Yeah, it was. Oh it was gosh. always okay. Five Blind Dates. All right. So what was the pitch? What was your log line uh, yeah. to like let people know that this is what I want to create and for them to say yes to? Uh, we just said it. it's about a girl who's told by a fortune teller that she is going to marry one of the next five dates she goes on. Ooh, <laughs> that is mysterious. That is like, ooh, I want to know what's next. And there's so many things that just went in my mind. So that's amazing. Can you describe the difference uh, between a soft pitch and your more formal pitch for, for the audience who oh, are looking right. into, okay, how did you go from content creating to pitching an actual idea to make it and distribute it into a film? Well, um, so soft pitch is sort of it's quite casually two people talking and you're like, oh, I have this idea about a character and you sort of just do like a one minute elevator pitch and see if they're interested. Okay. And if they are, then you can proceed to uh, the 
hard pitch. Okay. I'm, sorry, this is going a hard pitch. I'm just like, is it a seven page PDF document, you know, with themes, characters, like a show Bible or like, how, what do you need in order to get to the next step? Usually, yes, you would need a Bible. It's usually like the log line, uh, your characters, a outline of the movie. And if you do have anyone attached, people you have attached, anyone else that's working on the project, other co-writers, other producers that are attached. And it's um, and any themes in the movie that you're trying to uh, discuss. And uh, also uh, visually, maybe what the world looks like, any other references of other movies that you're trying to um, kind of be inspired by. Okay. Yeah, so they can get an idea of what it will look like in their heads when they read it. Okay, and when you say who's attached, because you were saying like your TikTok was just kind of mm, getting was, off, right? Yeah. And I, I hear so many from my director and filmmaker friends as well that it was very hard to get the first person that is more well known to be attached to it. But was that the case for you? Was it like a certain person that you were able to attach to your film that the studio was like, we know that person, we're gonna green light it? Or was that process easy for you? So you, usually in an independent film, that's what you would need to mm -hmm. get money to make the movie. You would need someone quite famous to be attached. But uh, in our case, we had no one attached. The story alone <laughs> was amazing. Yeah. That's essentially what we're saying here, that the writing Basically. was so good. Yeah. Yeah. The soft pitch and the formal pitch was so good. Like Amazon couldn't deny that. They couldn't. Yeah. I think, it, you know, you talk about female empowerment and I think it really helped that it was mostly women in the room. Mm -hmm in the executive room listening to the pitch. Mm. And I think they're really related to the story of Leah and what she was going through, how she's so passionate about something, but she's so struggling in another area of her life. Um, and I guess that hit a few strings with some of the execs and it was an amazing pitch, I have to say. Like, <laughs> <laughs> no, this is the part where I go, go off queen, because when else are we going to go off? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's true. We, yeah, I th this feels so unnatural to have this attention. You know what? I feel, you asked me earlier how I feel. I feel really uncomfortable mm. because I've never had this much attention in my life for my career. And, you know, we don't, almost don't expect it. Mm -hmm. We, I was sure when I entered this career that I would have to revert back to my backup plan. What was your backup plan? Finance. I had a finance job. <laughs> we, got, we got the money somehow, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm, and they say, you know, you get, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, blah, 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 syndrome. Um, imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome. Yeah. It's so real. I'm just, I'm waiting for people to hate the movie, to say I can't write, to say she doesn't deserve this. I'm just so expecting it. I'm so ready for that to happen mm -hmm. that I'm almost not excited because I'm like oh mm. that's what's to come yeah yeah I think, I think that says a lot too about the opportunities that are given to folks like us right mm. the fact that you're saying that you weren't expecting this so you're actually going in like with all the devil's advocacy going on feeling like this is not enough this is not not enough where you know I, I call it the the mediocre white male syndrome where they feel like <laughs> everything is God's grace yeah, <laughs> yeah 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 and you don't gotta do any I'm like this is great you should like make this into a movie so I mean do you mm. still feel that way or do you feel like how how can we shift like perspectives here uh you know um I think I feel that way still because I feel like this movie is not enough. Like even having co-written something and starred in something, mm -hmm. I feel like it's still not enough to make waves. It's still not enough to get the attention I need to, I don't know, get into more projects and mm -hmm. get, um, get my foot in the door with bigger projects or be cast in something else that I want to be in. It's just not enough. And I think, I think, like, it's the responsibility. No, no, I wouldn't say responsibility. I think it's awareness that the community has as well, um, like how much they support us too. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so I really appreciate you even interviewing me about this. Oh, stop. I mean, it's an honor. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I feel very special because you want to hear it. And I think none of people maybe – care enough mm. to want to share these stories and I think sometimes there are hidden agendas when mm. like de when they choose what stories to share like maybe it's a PR person that's really pushing this person I think it's it's really 
a lot of things are out of our control. It depends on our the wider community and who they decide to support mm-hmm. is what I've noticed, which is, you know, bring like it's a bummer. Yeah. But it's the reality. Yeah. Um, if we're going to be real about yeah. certain things in our industry. Well, I'll drink to that. Thank you for giving <laughs> me the reality. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> These puns, I'm dead. <laughs> Um, but I just have to say maybe like shifting it from not being enough to like, girl, like you did it. Like who else can say that they pitched a film and Amazon picked it up and they actually went forward, financed, and it's actually coming out for everybody to see on Amazon Prime. It's like not one of those other streaming sites where you have to pay 60 whatever for. (laughs) I mean, a lot of people have Amazon Prime now, so Mm -hmm. like this will be a part of it. So to be able to say, I actually have a film that showcases one aspect Mm -hmm. of the Asian Australian experience Mm -hmm. or the diaspora in that way. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is huge. And I just want you to sit in that moment for a little. Because you're like, this is not enough. I'm like, girl, uh, have I made a film? Put it out there. No, I have not. So I think it's, it's, we have to get over that imposter syndrome. And then Mm. maybe just shifting from my work is not enough to I did that. I just added another layer. I added Mm. another story. Mm -hmm. And the more that we add Mm. does make a huge wave. And you're one of the pieces to that, Mm -hmm. you know. I am trying. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> you got to remind me cuz I have that terrible Asian parent, you know, like that uh, I don't it's like negative um, we call positive. it filial piety. We yeah, we definitely I've that feel piety to, yeah. you know, um I guess make my parents proud, yeah. but it's like the thing of like no matter what you do, it's not enough mm-hmm. for our parents. Well, let's let's dive deep into that yeah. because you know part of it too is <laughs> we, just like all these elements of identity. So, do your parents know what you do, and are they proud of what you do, or like are, have you told them that you do something else? Like I'm in finance, mom, mom and dad. <laughs> um, I think my dad still wants me to get into, back into finance because mm-hmm. he wants me to have a stable job so I can, you know, have a stable family and I can have more of a, like, that traditional family unit mm-hmm. where we bring in money and uh, we don't have to worry that we don't have a roof over our heads because mm-hmm. this industry is quite volatile. Um, my mom is a lot more supportive. She, I think, well, yeah, over the last four years she's been here Whereas, because my parents got divorced four years, five years ago. Okay. So my mom has been through the journey a lot more with me. So she sees um, that, you know, it's quite – it can be made into a career n- now. Uh, so she's less worried. But definitely – four years ago she was like I think you should come back give up your hobby and go back to your finance job I was like what did she call it a hobby yeah she calls this a hobby a dream yeah she thinks I'm just gonna get over it I'm gonna mm, be done with it and okay. I'll go back to finance how is she feeling now does she understand mm. the gravity of it or is it still like you know it's time to stop your hobby like that was good like I'm glad you did that but now it's time to go back to finance I think she does understand it now okay. um because she actually came on set with my sister oh. so they they have a cameo in the movie oh, I love cameos from parents <laughs> yes yeah and my agent was there and I think my agent helped me explain to her how big of a deal it was mm-hmm. and so now she understands it because she's like oh there's a lot of people on this set. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, why are they all asking you and catering to you? Like, my daughter must be very important. She's like the president. <laughs> it's almost like she made this happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, she's she's definitely um, aware of it now. So she's, she's sort of like, you know, just do it up to a point where you don't want to do it anymore. And then you know that you can always go back to finance. Okay. Well, your character, you you play a character named Leah mm-hmm. in Five Line Dates, and she is the owner of a tea shop, and it's either go on these dates or you're also conflicted with starting a family and settling mm-hmm. down, correct? Is yeah, that kind yeah, of like yeah. the, the pick, the pick, what you have to choose between in the film? Mm. Yes. So um, how cl- closely related are you <laughs> to your character in real life? She is pretty much 100% based on me. Okay. Yeah. This is how me and Nathan actually came up with the idea. Okay. He was like, tell me about you, Shu. We're going to write a movie that only you can be in, that only you can tell, like a story that only you can tell. And I was like, okay, let's do it. So I told him about this uh, little 
online tea shop and this tea store I used to have in Australia. I told him about this two-year ultimatum that I gave myself. I said, if I don't make it in LA in two years, I'm going to go back to my finance job. Uh-huh. Yeah. And, um, and then I was like, and my parents are pressuring me to get married and have kids. And I, I there's like no one suitable, like a, yeah, they're just at the time there was just not a, a suitor in my life. Yeah. In Australia? But uh, not here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did. I had a guy in Australia. Okay. And then we broke up when I'm like, moved. sorry, babe, my dreams are much bigger. Yeah. <laughs> I used to do that. I was, I used to move from city to city and just break mm. up with dudes whenever I left because okay. I was like, I got to chase my dreams. I got a career. I yeah. got to chase, you know, I got dreams I got to fulfill. Yeah. And guys are chasing you, you chasing your dreams. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I mean, I guess it's like a, got to bring a that full circle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so are there any moments in the film that are I'm pretty sure draws from real life experiences well you're going on five dates yeah so maybe we can go through each date okay okay yeah. so every family member so mom dad sister best friend and her like Leah they get to choose one person for okay her, which is why it's five blind dates and each person picks depending on who they well, yeah, who they think is best for Leah. Okay. But really they think they're, they're purely making the decision based on what they think is best for her, mm -hmm. not what is actually good for her okay. and what she wants. So it's a really interesting, uh, I guess. Projection of what your family wants. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> gotcha. Which is very stereotypical. I think when you watch it, I think a lot of Asians will be able to relate to these kind of people because – I think we all um, value different things mm -hmm. um, depending on what they th like, what they think is the most important in our lives. For example, my dad thinks money is really important in real life. You know, he'll tell me he'll, his, the pep talks he gives me and the, uh, the advice he gives me about dating guys is like, you have to be a good wife. You know, you, the man needs to make the money. You need to make sure you support him. You know, if he's working hard, you need to have dinner cooked at home. You need to, like, make him feel like the man. You need to really – because the man likes to feel like the man, so you need to, like, prop him up. And he'll give me real <laughs> – Yeah, I love this, though. I like making eye contact with <laughs> me <laughs> as you're doing this. Yeah. Like, you're like my dad. <laughs> Oh yeah, I can I can give you <laughs> yeah. all the dad advice yeah. you need. Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> like just like stuff that my toxic ex would tell me as well. Mm, okay. Because my dad is a very manly man. Like he thinks a very in a very traditional manly way. Okay. Which is totally understandable because he grew up in that generation. So he thinks that that's what works for those families. And I totally understand it biologically. Okay. When I look at it, I'm like, yes, it makes sense that there are roles in a family that need to be filled. There's a masculine role and there's a feminine role. And traditionally, it's a man who fits the masculine role, like the breadwinning and the female who who fills the more uh, feminine roles, which mm -hmm. might be like taking care of the home, which makes yeah. sense. Sometimes they're flipped. Like now, these days, yeah. it's untraditional. I was just going to ask in that sense then, how domesticated are you? Do you cook and clean as well? or You know what? I, I do. <laughs> Because I'm like, I'm not going to lie. I'm a good chef. Yeah. <laughs> Just naturally, not because I have to. Yeah, I like it. I yeah. actually really like taking care of people. Yeah. I've liked that my whole life. Mm -hmm. I think there was definitely a phase where I didn't. Um, uh, I yeah like when I moved to LA that's when it happened I was like nah I'm selfish I'm just gonna take care of myself yeah, uh, yeah screw that but there was points in my life where I was like I liked playing the the wifey character yeah and I liked cooking and and decorating the house and all of that I still do I love yeah. it I just need some money yeah. I need my man to provide <laughs> yeah. so I could just go do all the shopping yeah and uh, do <laughs> the all the films too yeah <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay. So your dad would pick more of the the wealth situation. Mm -hmm. What kind of guy would your mom pick for you? I think a, a a lover, like a like a really a guy who's more beat up. Can I say that? What what? And it's Did you say like more beat up? Beat up. Be, be, better. But how better? Do you, but B E T A. How do you say the word beta? Beta. Beta. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, my Australian is not the best. 
Yeah, you're, um, okay, so you have the alpha male and you have the beta male. Okay, yeah, the beta. gotcha, beta. beta. Okay, beta. sorry, I was translating <laughs> Australian. It was like, do 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 do. I was like, like looking a, at my a camera crew. Like, yeah. <laughs> a beta, a beta. I'm like, wife beta? I'm like, I thought we don't use that word anymore. <laughs> Shoot, that's not PC. <laughs> <laughs> so, beta, okay. Beta, okay. A beta fail. Sorry, I was <laughs> I feel bad because okay, I don't like to say that, but I do like those okay. kind of guys too. Just more, I guess, more soft and sensitive. Yeah, which I love too. Like, yeah. you know, just more they're like emotionally for you too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, emotionally available um, and uh, more sensitive, and I guess um, beige more and green flags, just no red flags. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll beige talk and green. through, communicate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't give me that controlling, insecure yeah, yeah. behavior. Okay, though. all right. I like yeah. that. Yeah. Okay, and then you have a sister that mm-hmm. picks for you. So mm-hmm. who does pick, sister pick for you? So sister picks this real spiritual guy. <laughs> okay. Talking like, like crystals. Yeah, 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 okay. yeah. Like yoga. Okay. Just wants to get me out of my comfort zone because she thinks I'm too uptight. Because oh. I am. <laughs> so <laughs> just someone that can, you know, put me uh, back in touch with the world. Okay. And get me out of my comfort zone. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then who are the other two? So then my best friend. Okay, your best friend. Yeah, he picks himself. <laughs> okay. I don't know. Is that sabotaging? Like... Yeah, I'm like, no, but we thought it was funny because um, we're like, who would he pick? And I guess he would think he's the best person for Leah because he's uh, like, you know what? We can just be, you know. Um, besties. 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 Man. Yeah. <laughs> besties. Besties. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. yeah. So he, he picks himself. Yes. All right. Totally self-sabotage. I'm just like, why are you wasting my day? Go pick a Chris Hemsworth. Look, pick one of the Hemsworth brothers that's not married. <laughs> well, you, you do your job. But picks himself. Okay. And then the last person who picks I is... Pick. And you pick. And yeah. who do you choose initially? Because I'm sure the story takes all these twists and turns. But initially, who do you pick for yourself? What kind of well, guy? Well, I don't pick anyone till right at the end. Oh, oh I don't that's even right, have right. any idea of who I want because I don't know who, what I want in the movie. And gotcha. Like, I that's like a right metaphor for real life, though. You just really never know until they pop up one day and like ding dong. Exactly. You know? Missy, I'm <laughs> Do engaged. I like you? <laughs> like a year ago, maybe two years ago, we're just like we hate men. Men are yeah. trash. Yeah. And then I was on that route. Yeah. I was the single living life, and then mm. I feel like the domesticated housewife now where I'm living my soft girl era and I'm like what the F have I turned into yeah, yeah. who are you <laughs> like who am I it is a transition though it is a transition it's, dark. it's like when you're ready you're ready yes yeah and, and no shade to people who have already been in relationships I get it now um but before <laughs> but before I was like this is a waste like what are you guys arguing about like yeah I could never and then yeah. you, you're like oh I see yeah, yeah, yeah. but communication is just like the biggest thing I feel yeah 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 it has been the thing yeah but I just wanted to catch up with you on your like dating life too if you're comfortable with that because I'm sure once this movie comes out and you are going on five blind dates the new google search will be like who is schwank who in a relationship with (laughs) because I did google you and that was like is she in a relationship oh really so spill the tea bestie (laughs) I met this like one guy maybe um like six months into moving my, to LA, moving okay. to LA, okay. and I think at the time because I had just come here, I was just this like a mess. I think I met you when I first moved here as well. We were just both single at the time, yeah. just ready to mingle. Yeah. Also, not ready to mingle. Actually, I yeah, take that back. Not. It was more like I hate, hate guys. <laughs> We're just like, guys are trash, and we just want to be single forever. We're like, we're drinking on that. Now we're drinking to your film and my engagement on tea. Out of the bar, Um, out of the, like, take me off these streets, babe. Like, it's great. Love it. What a transition. I know. Like, what year, one year, what difference one year can make? What a story arc, you know? (laughs) What a story arc. We should pitch this to Amazon next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's been a story arc. Mm, Yeah. So so. I've been wanting to know what has happened in between, what has transpired in between the we hate men do we still hate men or we hate some men there's definitely um yeah yeah i mean dating in la is really 
It's interesting because mm-hmm. I think this is a very um, transitional city. People come here for their careers. Yeah. Not many people come to settle down. Sure. Um, it's just, I guess, a, a result of being in this city. You end up settling down in mm-hmm. the city. But I don't think that's the ultimate goal for a lot of people. Yeah. I think they're here to get to a certain point in their careers and then they can think about setting, settling down, mm-hmm. which uh, makes sense. Uh, whereas in Australia, like most people, I would say like 95% of people are in stable, normal jobs, which is like flipped around over mm-hmm. here. Um, so most people think about settling down early. Like all of my friends got married and had kids in their early 20s. Um, that was just the thing to do and that was really normal. You find a, a mate, I guess, and then you just stay with them. You, mm-hmm. you don't really date around too You're much like once penguins. you find you someone you like. Life. Yeah, yeah uh, I guess it's, it's a very suburban uh, mm-hmm. mindset. Which, and here it's kind of like flipped. When yeah. you just say when you just said that, I'm like, yeah, it's kind of flipped where we, we do the career first and then you're lucky if you find somebody that's not doing the whole thing of we all want to be on camera and chase Mm -hmm. our dreams and Mm -hmm. you know yeah 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 so when you're in that circle and all your friends are just single and and just trying to chase like their dreams it just doesn't seem like settling Mm -hmm. down is a possibility because there's not really want anyone around you that's wanting to do the same thing Mm -hmm. so you really have to expand your circle so people outside of film and tv (laughs) or that have made it and are ready to settle down well i'm glad that you're saying that versus like then i just stuck with the career bye yeah yeah. (laughs) like like, you're actually saying you're open to the idea of like i can have a career too and Mm. i can also make space and time to find that person that partner Mm. with the love part yeah not like either or yeah and I think it's also compatibility is a huge thing I've discovered I used to think you just find someone you like and love conquers all and (laughs) as long as you like them you you can overcome all the issues yeah and that's the mentality people have in Australia because I used to fight tooth and nail with my my first boyfriend and this long-term boyfriend in Australia we fought all the time I used to get mad at him all the time. I was just angry at him all the time. And he was just the nicest guy in the yeah, world. I was like, were the reasons valid though? <laughs> Quite, well, at the time I thought they were. Okay. In hindsight, mm-hmm. they were not that bad. Like he would always come home late from working. Okay. And I'm like, oh, I just, because I'd make dinner every day and I'd like be sitting it's at home get eating cold. by myself. Exactly. And he'd be like, oh yeah, but home at seven. Seven o'clock comes around, he's not home. Eight o'clock comes around, he's not home. Nine o'clock. And I'm like, fuming by the time he gets back I'm just like the worst yeah let's check it out on him he was so nice he was like oh I'm sorry it's like sorry I was working to provide for us yeah. <laughs> I know. You know I'm like you don't have to wait that hard <laughs> you, but actually let me talk to your boss <laughs> yeah. but in highs I'm like oh actually that was a, a very responsible thing he was doing yeah. making money for the see family. but you're realizing that though that's growth that is gross. That's the time. I was such a brat. I was the biggest brat as a girlfriend. Yeah. I was the worst. You know what? I blame Chinese and Korean TV shows. Those dramas, they really, yeah. the, the, the expectation you have on guys after watching those shows is so high. You're just like, if you're not like making all that money and they're super writing for him, the nicest guy and bring me flowers every day, I don't want it. <laughs> Yeah, that was not reality. <laughs> I learned that the hard way. Yeah. I was like, oh, guys here are not like that. I felt like the guys in Australia were much nicer. Like I could be the biggest bitch, but they would just <laughs> still fall at my feet, you know? Yeah. Just still just <sighs> so easy to manipulate. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, okay, so bad. I was talking about that. Yeah. I'm like, guys, you're dating now. Like, would you go for Australian men or American men? Um, I just go for nice men. Okay. I don't care about the okay the, the uh, nationality so much. There you go. But I did. I have found it hard to find like an American guy who's very, I guess, um, nice, feminine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like Australians are very nice. Americans are just chasing their careers. I'm like, yeah. Australians are Americans. You're like, uh, nationality doesn't count. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> but um, I just, I discovered that they're like, I didn't know what toxic guys were. Like, I okay. was quite toxic. Now that I think about it, in okay. my previous relationships, not the guys. But now I'm like, oh, I've turned into not toxic, and the guys are just toxic here. Um, but 
Yeah, it took me a long time to realize that I was in like a really toxic relationship for a long time. Like it got yeah. really abusive. And that was the first time I had experienced an abusive relationship was here. Wow. I didn't even know that's what I was in. And all yeah. my friends were like, you're in an abusive relationship. And I was like, no, 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 I'm not. It's I'm not, not just physical. It's like emotional. Yeah. It's, you know, yeah. yeah, it was really <laughs> messed up. It really messed me up for a long time. And I think after that, I just really gave up on dudes. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, this is scary. Yeah. Like you just, you can't put your trust in someone. Like I used to, I used to 100% trust the person I was with. And I think the the sad thing is the toxic people don't know they're being toxic. Mm -hmm. They just think they're being the most loving partner ever. Yeah. Yeah, my ex would always be like, I'm doing this for you. I'm doing this for you. You know, n there's no one else that, you know, supports you like I do. Yeah. I, you know, I help you with this and I help you with that. I'm like, yeah, you do. But like th that's... Like not a nice thing you do for your partner when you're in a relationship. Yeah. That's bare minimum. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're doing bare minimum. Yeah, that's and what I've had to learn. And I think it's because maybe we don't feel like we're in toxic relationships because, uh, you know, just d in doing podcasts and hearing all these relationship podcasts, it's like the term manipulation or narcissism really wasn't something that we threw around so freely. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It was almost like throwing around therapy and it's still that stigma with getting mm. a, a therapy therapy with especially within the Asian American community oh yeah but you know I was talking to my mom the other day about like how like previous exes were very narcissistic yeah yeah and she, you know it was like what does that mean yeah you know so I'm just like even the definitions yeah. have grown that we can yeah. actually define and label what it yes. is and I think that's it's because I see a lot of the older generation I'm just really gonna call people out right now but I see some of the older Chinese generation especially from the men and they do portray some quite narcissistic qualities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it's um, – something's a part of our culture um, that we as women and as children we put up with because mm -hmm. that's what you're taught to do yeah. as a good Chinese daughter. You just yeah. put up with certain behaviors that you look at now and realize that's – kind of manipulative and narcissistic, but it's accepted. Yeah. And maybe that's why, because narcissistic, when you term it like that, it sounds like a negative thing and something yep. we need to change and address yep. and fix. But what do you do when the it's so ingrained in the culture they don't see mm -hmm. it as a problem? I like how you got quiet there. I was like, <laughs> say it louder for the people in the back, girl. <laughs> like, that's what I was feeling. <laughs> it's okay <laughs> call them out <laughs> oh this is not okay yeah. this is not good behavior um no yeah. I just love being able to talk about that because you know I haven't really been able to talk about relationships in our past but because your film is so on that mm. that's the only reason why normally mm. I don't start yeah, a yeah, podcast yeah. like what is your <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, this kind of ties <laughs> in like, what are the overall themes and messages like through your film as well five landing dates and just kind of the experiences that you've had with dating in Australia Australia and LA that you want audiences to get the most out of? Mm, um, I think the key message uh, that Nathan and I were thinking about when we made this was there is no such thing as a perfect person, mm -hmm. but there is someone who's perfect for you because Hallmark card. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, put it on a show. the hardback card. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because through, you know, both Nathan and I have dated enough to know that, you know, there's there's no one that's perfect. We're always, as I, I don't know about you, but I was raised to think that there was a perfect guy out there and I just had to like keep breaking up with people till I found that perfect mm -hmm. guy. But no perfect guy exists. He might be good in one area, but not great in another area. Like he might be like super, super like loving, will pay for everything and will deal with you when you're being a bitch, but he'll come home at like 1 a.m. in the morning because he, he's working. It's, it's just like <laughs> you're working, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so there's, you know, there's pros and cons of mm -hmm. every relationship. There's pros and cons of every person. And I've also discovered I'm not perfect. I used to think I was like the, like, the bomb diggity. I'd be like, you are <laughs> lucky to date me, my man. <laughs> and so that is what gave me this kind of like blind confidence to treat my exes like shit because mm. I'm like you're not going anywhere because 
I'm as good as you're going to get. But that it's is like rule, rule reversal yeah. in that way. Yeah. <laughs> and that was so toxic. But okay. I, I don't know. I don't know what gave me that stupid confidence. And sometimes we need that like blind confidence to even do what we're doing. Mm-hmm. It's like that. The um, oh, what you were saying before the mediocre white man syndrome. Yeah, yeah. They're just so entitled. Yeah. I was so entitled in relationships. Okay. Uh, yeah. But it's good that you recognize. I think that's the other part of feeling that we can say these things about ourselves too, but we can only say it because you recognize that it starts here. Mm. And unless we fix that, there's no way we're going to be able to find that perfect relationship because we are still going out spewing toxicity in our relationships. (laughs) So it's like if you're really serious about relationships, Mm. it's like that's when you do the the inner work, the Mm. the work that you need before you get into those other relationships. Because otherwise it's just not really fair for the other person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh my god, I'm, I must have been like such a pain to deal with. But I think that was good. See, there was good and bad <laughs> to me too. I was like an utter bitch, but I was really supportive and like really committed and very loyal. Yeah. And... So what's it like dating Shu now? Oh, I'm like really healthy. I've, there's definitely moments, but I'm a lot healthier than I used to be. A lot more understanding, a lot okay. more empathetic. I think okay. that toxic ex mm, like, was really... Okay. Because he would be really demanding, tell me this is how I should act. I'm like, no, that's not how I should act. Okay, that's act. controlling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it, I think it made me kind of think about what guys want more. Because mm-hmm. like I said, when I first moved here, it was all about shoe. It's what I want. Like if I want to chase my career and I want to go make that video with that guy and you're jealous about it, I don't care. I'm going to go do it because it's going to help my career. That was my mm-hmm. mentality. And it hurt a lot of people. I get it. But I think it takes a certain type of guy also to date people like us. Yeah. Guess, to feel very secure with themselves and be mm-hmm. like, yeah, you're out there going. You, you kind of want that hype person. Like, I support you. Go yeah. get it. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, mm-hmm. go shoot that video with Liam Hemsworth. Yeah. You're the one that's not taken. <laughs> you know, I don't even know. <laughs> you know, go yeah, yeah. shoot that yeah, video. Yeah. It's okay. He's yeah. shirtless. Yeah. It's okay. Do that scene. <laughs> and I get that it's yeah. hard. I get now, I think, before I feel like, you know what, you should just support me no matter what. Like, it's your feelings. You need to change. But I get some guys just need that, um, uh, uh, like, that um, the reassurance, the reassurance yeah. from us that they're our only dude, that even if there's a, like, a shirtless Liam Hemsworth in the other room, I always come back to you. I think they need that reassurance. And mm-hmm. maybe I just wasn't that good at giving it. Because I, I think I just expected them to just have that. Because that's what it was like in Australia. They, they didn't really care about what I did. I used to just do all of my movie things. And my ex was like, yeah, that's fine. Like there was no insecurity <laughs> whatsoever. Gotcha. So I never had to deal with someone who was insecure. And I I'm, I realized I'm not very good at it. I'm not the mm. most patient. I Go. see. Right. You're like, get over it. We were shirtless. We did a bedroom scene. Get over it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I still love you. <laughs> I still love you. Yeah, this is look- toxic. <laughs> it's also, this is Hollywood. <laughs> yeah. So it is a very different situation. Yeah. Like, I don't even know, like, if you can give us a comparison between, like, does Australia have their Hollywood? Like, what is it mm. like trying to break out in the film world in Australia versus very difficult. coming straight to, like, the epicenter of it? Oh, we have a very small industry. Mm-hmm. Like I said, there's probably less than five percent of the population that's a creative because there is just not enough market. So um, uh, it was hard. Like I don't think I would have the career that I have today if I was still back in Australia. Yeah. Any well wishes for the audience for love, health, prosperity, wellness, anything as it is Lunar New Year. Mm. But Lunar New Year. Yeah. It's for wearing red. Good day, bye, Joy. Yeah. Okay, here's some shoe advice. Uh, I think for all you ladies out there and men as well, I think it's totally feasible to have a career and a love life. Uh, I think you do have to choose which one you want to prioritize at a certain point in your life. Uh, and it's totally okay to prioritize your career. And every woman and man should feel empowered to do that. But also be available to let love in Mm. and know when it is the right person. It's okay. You will still make your career work even if you have a little bit – like if you want to make a little bit of space for your relationship, just know that you do need to make time for it. But it can work. They can both work. You just need to work out your priorities. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well spoken. Well, thank you, Shu, um, for allowing us to have this amazing conversation in your oh, home in LA. Thank you. I am looking very much forward to Five Blind Dates, which you all watch on Amazon Prime. Amazon Again, it is Prime. the first Amazon original ever to come out of Australia. And mm. I cannot believe I'm sitting next to the co-writer and lead actress of it. So Aww. thank you for having us in your home. Thanks. One last cheers to you. Yes, I actually have a gift for you. What? Yes. Oh. It's a bl- it's my blemish bling line. It's a new pimple patch that I've created. <laughs> yeah. Um, I hope you like it. It's got hydrochloride, nicotinamide, and salicylic acid, and also tea tree oil. That sounds like all amazing stuff to make the pimple go away. Yeah. Yeah. Pimple patches are life. I guess I don't know why I'm getting so many pimples these days. When I was traveling, I think maybe because of the food I was eating, I was just breaking out all the time but pimple patches make such a big difference it really increases the um the healing time and also i used to pop my pimples a lot this prevents me from popping oh my, my gosh pimples. i'm sorry yeah. you just busted out the hail mary hour that you just invented and created your own line of pimple patches <laughs> the blemish bling i mean just again you just are s- <laughs> You surprise me every day. <laughs> You're like a one hard working woman. You deserve everything, mm. all the love, all the accolades you're about to receive for this film. I want you to receive everything and not feel scared about anything, but just embrace it and take it into the next thing that you're going to do because I just wish you all the best in all your endeavors. Mm. Thank you, Nikki. You're so yeah, sweet. Well, thank thank you. you. I can't wait to put these on my face. It has my face on it. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Is that you? Yeah. It's a cartoon version of me. Baby shoe. I know my baby shoe Yes, I know your baby shoe. (laughs) I'm going to have shoe on my face. (laughs) Well, thank you. Thank you all for watching. You've been watching the Nikki Sun Show. I'll see you in the next episode. Bye. Bye.